Hi guys, welcome back to the seventh tutorial in our series on Apache Cassandra. In the last tutorial, we talked about partitioning data, token, and the Cassandra ring. In this tutorial, we'll talk about how Cassandra handles replication and how the concepts of data centers and racks come into play in Cassandra. So one of the main advantages of Cassandra is that it can be used across multiple data centers. So this is really powerful as it allows us to store data in multiple regions around the world and store backups of our data in multiple regions. So even if, for instance, a data center in Europe that we're using to store data goes down, we might still be able to use a backup that we have in the USA as Cassandra will allow us to store and replicate our data across data centers. So for example, each large rectangle in this image represents a data center. This first large rectangle might represent a data center that is located in the EU. This second large rectangle might represent a data center, for instance, in the USA. So Cassandra can store data in both data centers. If we want to write a record to our database, it might go into our Cassandra cluster and store a piece of data here. And at the same time, Cassandra's replication strategy will also allow that same piece of data to be stored in the United States data center. So this means that if we lose a piece of data, we will still be able to access the data in the US data center. Or in an even worse scenario, if the entire European data center goes down, which can occur or is temporarily not available, again, we can still access the data through a different data center in a different region or possibly even a backup data center in the same region. So Cassandra also has built in the concept of racks. So a rack in a data center is basically a cluster of connected machines. Each small square in each data center here represents a different rack. So we might have rack one, rack two, rack three, and rack four in our EU data center, and the same in our USA data center, rack one, rack two, rack three, and rack four. Cassandra can take a rack aware approach. So again, if we write data to our European data center and say in this instance, we're only running in one data center, we might initially write the data to rack two or a machine on rack two, but we also want to replicate that data to different racks. So we might also replicate in rack one and we might also replicate in rack four. So this means again, that if say the rack goes down or the cluster of machines in the data center goes down, we can still access our data either through rack one or rack four. And a rack is a cluster of machines, so a cluster of network machines. When we're adding a new node to Cassandra, we're able to assign it to a data center and a rack. And this is how Cassandra knows which rack and which data center the new node is assigned to. So we simply provide a string value for the data center and a string value for the rack. Say one of our nodes that we've assigned to the cluster, we might just give it the value for rack of rack one, data center, data center one. And then if we want to add a second node that we know is in a different rack in the same data center, we simply assign it rack two in data center one. So if we jump back onto the Cassandra machine where we installed our Cassandra instance in a previous tutorial, we can look at the properties that represent what data center and what rack this instance of Cassandra is currently running on. So the first thing we need to do is just make sure our Cassandra service is up and running by typing sudo service Cassandra start. So now we know the service is up and running, we can type no tool status, and this will give us the status of all the nodes in our cluster as we saw before. And in this case, it will give us what rack each node in our cluster is running on. So at the moment, we're only running a one node cluster as we only have one machine in the cluster. But when we run this, we'll be able to see what rack this machine has been assigned to. So we can clearly see here under the rack property that this machine or this instance of Cassandra is running on rack one. We can also see some other interesting information that we saw in the previous video here, the number of tokens or virtual nodes that this machine has and how much of the data in the database it effectively owns or what token range it owns. In this case, because this is the only machine on the database, this machine effectively owns all of the token range. So it owns 100% of the token range. So if we're adding a new node and we wanna change what rack or what data center the new node is being added to, say for instance, we know the new node is in a different data center or running on a different rack in the same data center, we can configure this in the Cassandra configuration files. 
So in order to do this, we need to change directory to where the Cassandra configuration files are located. In our case, they are located in etc slash Cassandra. So we change directory there, and then list the files that are available. And the Cassandra rack and data center properties, or what rack and what data center we're assigning this node to, are located in the Cassandra rack DC properties file. So to have a look at that, we can type nano Cassandra rack DC properties, and we can view it using the nano text editor. And this will show us what rack and what data center this instance of Cassandra is assigned to. So in this case, we can see that the data center is DC1, which is the default, and the rack is rack1. So these indicate the rack and DC for this node, and they're used by the gossiping property file snitch, which we'll look at in a later video. But if we wanted to add a new node and it was operating in a different data center, we would simply change the data center to something different, say DC2, for the new instance of the node we're adding. And the same for the rack. If we're adding a new machine and we know it's on a different rack, we might simply assign the rack to rack2. So how does Cassandra determine what nodes our data is replicated to? Cassandra has two main strategies for determining this. It has the simple strategy and the network topology strategy. The simple strategy is the most straightforward and is mostly used for Cassandra clusters that are operating in a single data center or perhaps even in a single rack. So how does Cassandra know how to replicate our data across the cluster? For the simple strategy, we'll return to our ring diagram as we saw earlier. And for every key space in a Cassandra cluster, and key space is not something we've talked about yet, but we'll discuss it beginning in the next video. The only thing we need to know here is that a key space is similar to a database in a relational database management system. And for every key space, we need to assign a replication factor. A replication factor determines how many nodes we want the data for that key space to be replicated or copied to. In this case, for instance, if we set the replication factor, replication factor to three, we are saying that we want the data in our database to be stored on three separate nodes. So we might store data on node one, we might store the copy of the same data on node two, and we might store a third copy of the data on node three. And this means that even if two nodes go down, or perhaps one node goes down and one node is poorly performing, we still have access to our data through the third node. The simple strategy is quite easy to follow. We simply find the token for the record we're trying to add it and add the record to the token range where that would fall. Say if our record falls in the token range of zero and 10, it might have a token of five. We simply add the first replication to the node where it should be assigned, in this case, node one. Then based on our replication factor, we move around the circle or around the ring and add the data to each node until we meet our replication factor. So we also add it to node two, which means we've replicated twice. And then we add it to node three, moving around the cluster, meaning we've replicated it three times and we've met our replication factor. So we no longer need to replicate the data to node four or node five because we have replicated to three nodes already. If we had set a replication factor to four, we would also continue to move around the ring to node four and we would also replicate our data here. You cannot set a replication factor greater than the number of nodes on the cluster. The network topology strategy is more complicated, but it basically allows you to specify a different replication factor for each data center. Within a data center, it allocates replicas to different racks in order to maximize availability. So thanks for watching this video on data centers, racks, and replication in Cassandra. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comment section. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up or subscribe to the channel. In the next video, we'll jump into CQL or Cassandra query language and apply many of the lessons we've learned in the videos up until now.